welcome to the library research seminar. Uh, there's two parts to this seminar. The first one we take a look at plagiarism. Um, and the second one what we do is we actually take a look at the project that you're going to be handing in to me. So we're going to do the first part here and it begins with the question, what is plagiarism? And I know a lot of you already have an idea of what plagiarism is because you've probably heard about this word before, but it's something very important to understand in grade nine and certainly in, in grades that after grade nine, uh, and it's certainly something you want to avoid. So the definition for plagiarism, it is the act of presenting the words, ideas, sounds, or the creative expression of others as your own. Now I certainly want, when you do your, set, your, your essay for me, I certainly want you to use other people's ideas, but the trick to this is that you have to give credit to other people. If you're trying to pass off other people's work as your own, then that is plagiarism. So students, if you have included the words and ideas of others in your work that you neglected to cite, and just see that first point. The interesting thing about the word cite is it's C-I-T-E, so that means a citation, or if you have had help you would not want your teachers to know about, you've probably plagiarized. There are two main types of plagiarism. The first one is intentional, and this is where students or people mean to plagiarize. It's, it's, very, it's something that has been done on purpose. So an example would be copying a friend's work clear example of plagiarism. The second would be buying or borrowing papers. There are sites that you can go to on the internet, I believe, where you can purchase papers with your credit card and hand them in as your own. Cutting and pasting text without proper documentation. Now in the digital world that we're in right now, it's really easy to go to a website and to, to, to go onto somebody else's work to take a block of text, to copy that text, to open up a word um, processing document and to paste that in as your own. But when you're doing that, it's plagiarism because what you're, you're trying to do is pass somebody else's ideas off and somebody else's words as your own. And the last one would be media, borrowing without documentation. An example of that one right there, and I see quite often, is when people put posters together and they go on the internet and they start taking all these photographs or these pictures or these images and they glue them on. But one of the things you have to make sure that if you're doing that, you have to be uh, giving proper documentation to that. Now the second broad category of plagiarism would be unintentional. And this is where people are plagiarizing but they're not meaning to do it because they don't realize what is plagiarism and what is not plagiarism. So an example of this would be careless paraphrasing. Now the word paraphrasing means taking somebody else's thoughts or ideas and changing them into your own words. Um, and some people get the idea that if you take somebody else's a, a, a few sentences from a source and you just tinker around with a couple words that makes it your thought or idea, it doesn't. And that's, that's called paraphrasing. And paraphrasing is good to use, but again if you paraphrase you have to use what's called an in-text citation. Poor documentation or not bothering to cite where you should. Quoting excessively. If your essay is quote, 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 then it really begs the question, is this your work or are you just taking somebody else's words and just putting it into your essay too much? And the last one is failure to use your own voice. And what that means is, we all as writers have a voice that we use when we write. If I read it and it doesn't sound like yours, and if it, if it sounds like a first year university student, and I know that you don't write like that, then that could be you've accidentally plagiarized. So a couple real life consequences here. And I'll just read them out to you here. The first one is a British Columbia High School student was denied her seat as a Harvard freshman when it was discovered she plagiarized in a local BC newspaper. A 
Another example is Janet Cook, a journalist from the Washington Post, admitted to copying and fabricating many of her editorials. She resigned from her position and had to return what's called a, her Pulitzer Prize. So, in I guess the point of these examples is, in life outside of school, when you're caught plagiarizing, there are some very, very um, big consequences for that. So it's important here in grade nine to make sure you're doing the right thing so you don't plagiarize and you understand that it is very serious. So when you copy others work without proper, proper documentation, you run the risk of losing what's called your academic integrity. And we all have a level of academic integrity and what you want to do as a student, whether at Francis Kelsey or any other school you go to after Francis Kelsey, you want to maintain a high level of academic integrity. You want your teachers, your peers, your instructors, your professors to think of you as an, as an honest student. And when you, when you plagiarize, you'll lose that academic integrity. So the question that, I, that as, is asked is, do you have to cite everything? And the answer to that is no. Facts that are widely known or information that is considered common knowledge do not have to be documented. So the, the question then becomes, what is common knowledge? So some examples of common knowledge are, water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. Now that is a, a fact that almost everybody would agree on. It's nobody's original thought or idea. If you were to write that, if you're doing a scientist, scientific paper and you wrote that in, you wouldn't have to worry about documenting that. Here's, here, here's a bit more of a historical um, fact here. The World Trade Center was attacked on September 11, 2001. Again, if you were to put that on, you wouldn't have to worry about who you're going to give credit to because it's not an original thought or idea, it's common knowledge. It's when you get another original thought or idea that you have to put it in. So when you're borrowing from other people's work, and like I s said again in the beginning, I really do want you to use other people's ideas. The key is just to give credit properly. Three strategies that you can use are quoting, paraphrasing, and summarizing. So quoting, quotations are the exact words of an author copied, copied directly from a source, word for word. Quotations must be cited. Now quotations, again, are you probably know are the exact words are inside quotation marks. But what you have to do at the end of a quotation is you have to have the brackets giving credit to who came up with those original words or ideas. Now you'd use quotations when you want to add the power of an author's words to support your argument. You might be writing a paper and you might read some powerful words uh, from a person like Nelson Mandela that you cannot have said better yourself. And adding Nelson Mandela's exact words is going to make it a stronger paper or argument. You should put those words in, in quotation marks. Again, it, I think that leads to my second point. You want to highlight particularly eloquent or powerful phrases or passages. You want to note important research which precedes your own research. Now paraphrasing, this I think for a lot of grade nine, sometimes this is a new word for you. So paraphrasing means rephrasing the words of an author in your own words. It is still the author's original thought, but it's phrased again in your own words. Now you use paraphrasing when you want to avoid overusing quotations. And I talked earlier in the seminar or the presentation that you don't want to use too many quotations. It's good to use, it's good to paraphrase other people's ideas and put them in your own words. And the reason is, if you, and it leads to the second point, 
you want to present information in your own voice. And I talked about what your own voice was before. And when I read your papers, when I go to mark your papers, I want to make sure that the, what I'm reading is your voice, not somebody else's voice. Again, at the end of your paraphrase, you do have to put what's called an in-text citation. Summarizing is the third strategy, and this involves taking the work and thoughts of an author and shortening them into your own words. When you summarize, you stick to the main ideas. And most people know this when I've done seminars in the past, um, because you've been asked by teachers in the past to summarize something, and what you're doing is you're taking a big piece of text, you're taking the main ideas, just the main ideas, and putting it into a smaller you know, piece of text. Uh, and it's a good strategy to have to summarize. Now here's kind of the, one of the key parts of the seminar. How do I make text citations? And then in brackets I put MLA style. MLA stands for Modern Language Association. It's one of a very commonly accepted style of how to write an essay. And I picked MLA because it's very widely accepted. Um, the other one would be APA, which you've probably heard before. But for the purpose of the seminar and the paper that you're gonna write, I want you guys to, st to stick to MLA style. At the end of a quotation, summary, or paraphrase passage, before the period, include the author's last name and page number in brackets. The full sources for in-text citations must be in your works cited page, which is the last page, in correct MLA style. Use the MLA style sheet found in the library at the front desk, and also your learning guide if you turn it to the very back page, if you turn it over, I have put lots of examples how to, how to write things in MLA style uh, when you do your work cited page. The work cited page also sometimes is more commonly known as a bibliography, but again when we're using MLA style, it's referred to as a work cited page. So here's an example of an in-text citation. And in fact, it's just something that I've made up here. So, it's a quotation because we can see the quotation marks, but the quotation is slightly more than 73% of Canadian high school students reported plagiarizing papers in their high school careers. Again, I just made this up, it's fictitious. But we've got uh, quotations at the end of careers, so the whole thing is in quotations. It's somebody else's original thought or idea, their exact words. So notice that at the end of the quotation after careers, there's bracket, the last name, which is Smith, of the author. There's a space with no punctuation. And then that 203 represents the page number. Then we have the, the uh, second bracket, and then the punctuation follows. And that's really how it should look. You can put more than one author in there. Um, if it's, a, if it's a, a website that doesn't have the author, put the title of the website. But you really have to make sure that you're using an in-text citation if it's somebody else's original thought or idea. So the last thing I'm going to talk about before we move on to part two of the seminar, which deals with the library research project itself, is that works cited page. All sources used must be included on your works cited page. So if you've cited four or five different pieces of work in your essay, you have to make sure or you should make sure that when that um, you have included those in your works cited page. This is the last page of your paper. Sometimes I see the mistake of people trying to, to put the works cited page. If they finish their essay and there's half a page left, try to put it underneath. It has to be the work, the last page of your paper on its own. And list your sources alphabetically, last name first, using the style in the MLA style sheet. So if you don't have a last name, you can use a, the title of the article. Some last thoughts here before we move on to the second part of the presentation. You must use a minimum of three sources when you research your paper. One source must be World Book Online, and again we have the passwords here in the library. Other sources may be books, encyclopedias, magazines, newspapers, movies, interviews, 
websites or pamphlets. And again, where you'd put this information, when you, put your, when you write your research plan, this would be in your third column. So this is part two of the seminar, and this is where I um, introduce the project that you'll be working on. So one of the things to note here is that you actually get dual credit for this learning guide. You get three credits in social studies and two for English. It's learning guide six to eight for social studies nine, and learning guide 16 and 17 for social studies nine. Okay, so what I'm gonna do for this part of the seminar, I'm, I'm gonna open up the learning guide and go through the different parts of it. So if we just take it and we turn to page two, one of the things you'll notice about this learning guide is that there's lots of different bits and pieces to it. And what's really important to me as the teacher and the person who's gonna mark this is that writing a good essay is a process, not an event. So when you hand in your package to me, what I really want to see is that you're going to be handing in all these bits and pieces. So starting for the first one, it's the library research seminar, and that's what we're doing right now. What's, what I'd like you to do is to make sure that you hand in all your notes from what you've seen in the first part of this video and this part as well. And that's how I will know that you've done the YouTube video and that you've taken the seminar. The second thing is you have to choose a topic. You have to come up with a research plan. You have to do some notes. You have to do an outline. I need to see a rough draft with some editing. Of course, your final essay, and I'll talk a little bit more in the, in the seminar about how I'd like you to present that and the last thing is the works cited page. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about the topics that you can choose for this research paper. The first one is answering the question, has the technological revolution increased or decreased our quality of life? So the industrial revolution saw the invention of many machines that eased the burden of manual labor. For example, the power loom and in general made life easier for the ordinary person, for example, the locomotive. The technological revolution that we're in the midst of right now is really just a continuation of the Industrial Revolution. Computers, the internet, internet, cell phones, texting and cable television, and YouTube that you're watching right now are just a few of the innovations of the last few decades, and it's hard now to imagine life without them. Some critics, however, have argued that the technological revolution has done little for us other than increase our hours of work and destroy our privacy. Has the technological revolution increased or decreased our quality of life? Take a firm stand in a well-constructed essay. It should include, include at least four or five good arguments. So for this one right here, what I found as a teacher, although it's the longest topic, it's one of the ones that's a little bit more difficult to find resources on and I'm not, I'm not trying to turn you off from doing it but sometimes the term technological revolution is not as well recognized. Um, you might want to try the information communication revolution and I really want you to focus on the last 30 years or so. Okay, So we're focusing on things like the birth of the internet, social networking, cell phones, texting and things like that. You don't want to go too far back for this one. And again, if you want to talk to me about this topic, you can. Topic two tries to answer the question, how has the Industrial Revolution contributed to the environmental concerns we have today? So reading from the, the learning guide here, many of the environmental concerns that trouble us today had their roots in the era of the Industrial Revolution. Consider problems such as acid rain, air and water pollution, species extinction, and greenhouse gases, which leads uh, to global warming. Choose one area to investigate. Your essay should trace the development of the problem from the industrial era to the present day. A superior essay will also suggest possible solutions to the problem. So this one, what you're gonna take a look at again is one environmental problem. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, prior to the 1700s, the environment was in fantastic shape around the world. But because of industrialization, because of the factories and the mills and the pollution that's, that uh, those have produced, we find ourselves in a difficult position. So make sure you pick one. Topic three is gives an, give an overview of child labor past and present. 
and make suggestions as to what individuals can do to alleviate or make less severe the effects of child labor on children around the world. So child labor really began in the Industrial Revolution in the mid-1700s. Before that, kids would work on farms, but this is the first time that kids were actually being paid a wage and working hours and working in very poor conditions in the Industrial Revolution. Um, lucky for us in the, in the developed world, there's many laws that prevent children from working in factories and things like that. But in other parts of the world, in the developing world, children still work uh, in factories or in mills and they work for a little low wage and in very dangerous uh, conditions. Uh, they don't have the access that we do to, to public education. So for this one, again, give an overview of child labor. You might want to look at the, the past during the Industrial Revolution. You might want to take a look at uh, child labor today and again, focus on what we can do to alleviate or make less severe. You might want to focus on the work by a person named Craig Kielberger. We have some of his books here in the library. So those are the three topics. The length should be four to 600 words, somewhere between that. If you're a little bit under, it's not too big a deal. If you're a little bit over, it's not too big a deal. If you're going to go way over, I want you to have a conversation with me. And if you're way under 400 words, again, come have a conversation with me in the library. So those are the topics. The next thing that I want to talk about is what's called our learning plan. So for the research plan, this is activity number three, what I'd like you to do is take a piece of it can either be a piece of line paper or a piece of blank paper that I have here and turn it on its side. And I want you to make a three column organizer. Exactly like I've done here, three equal columns. On the left, oh sorry, on the le left side of your paper, I want you to write the question, what do I already know about my topic? And this is what's called prior knowledge because I know Everybody that does this essay has some level of prior knowledge. So if you're doing child labor, you might put some things you know about child labor. If you've chosen to do global warming, you might put some of your knowledge about global warming. You're gonna do this in point form. In the middle column, the question is, what do I need to learn? So this is the, where the research comes in. You're gonna have questions about your topic that you don't know where you're going to have to go out and try to find the answers through doing research. So in the middle organizer, I'd like you to put uh, any questions you have. For example, if you're doing child labor, you might want to put the question, which countries does child labor still happen? Or which countries in the world has the most children working? Or something like that. These are the questions you're going to try to explore. The last column is possible sources. This is where you're going to get the information. And what's really important about this essay is I want everybody doing some research. I don't want people sitting down and just trying to write an essay from what they know uh, in their head. I want everybody doing some research. So this is where you're going to get the information. One of the places that I want you, or one of the things I want you to do is use something called World Book Online. Okay, World Book Online is a very reputable uh, source that you can use, um, and you can use it at home or you can use it at school here, and we have the passwords at the front uh, at the library desk. Other things you could use would obviously be books from the library here, and I can help you, or Mrs. Bonner can help you find those books. Magazines, DVDs, videos, uh, anything like that, newspaper clippings, are all good possible sources. Again, for books, you can use the library here at school, or you can use our public library system as well. So I want you to put down all the places where you may be able to get that information. The learning plan is worth 10 marks as well. Make sure again when you hand in your package to me that this is included and filled out as completely as it can. In fact, what I'd like students to do is to show me their learning plan before they go on to the next step. So that's activity number three. Activity number four, the learning guide, are the notes. Okay, and in the learning guide that you have, I'm not going to go through this whole thing, that will take too much time, but it does um, describe how to do notes. What's really important when you're doing notes is that for every different source you use, use a different piece of paper. So for example, if you're using World Book Online, have a piece of line paper out, write at the top of a World Book Online, and then in point form, write the notes that you have. 
Do not write everything out because you won't have time. Good notes is taking things in point form. When you're done with World Book Online, you take that piece of paper, you put it to the side, you get a new piece of paper out, and you start taking notes from your new source. If it's a book, put the full title of the book up above and take notes in point form. You must have minimum three sources when you do your essay. Okay, More is better, but minimum three sources. And again, I want you to hand in your notes. Your notes are worth 10 marks. And I'm going to use this criteria here when I mark your notes. Activity number five is the outline. And an outline is like a roadmap for an essay. Everybody that does this essay has to do an outline first. And I want you to do your outline um, using the outline sheet that we have at the front desk of the library. If you can't find it, you can ask myself or you can ask Mrs. Bonner. And that's a must that you use that, that skeleton. Okay. And what I always say to students is an outline is a roadmap of how you're going to write your essay. Once you've done the re proper research, you've taken good notes, once you have a good outline, the writing of the rough draft becomes the easy part because you've done that work first. So make sure that you have a very good outline. Look at the criteria that we have right here, the notes that we have right here. Make sure you use the sheet of the front desk of the library. Again, this is worth 10 marks. This has to be handed in with your package. Activity number six is a rough draft. And again, rough draft is a very important part of writing to make revisions. Um, so make sure you do your rough draft. Make sure that you're having people yourself edit. You can do peer editing, which means a friend can edit. You can have your mom or dad at home take a look and do some editing. Okay. Um, and then make sure that, again, this is handed in. This one's not worth marks, but I would like everybody to do it. And one of the things in your rough draft is I want everybody to be using some what are called in-text citations. So there's an example. I'm just going to circle what's called an in-text citation. And that is, again, I talked about that in the slideshow that you just saw previous to this in part one of our seminar here. Um, and you can see that for this right here, we've got end of quotation, we've got a parenthesis, we've got last name of, our, of the author, Clark, slash another author, McKay, space with no punctuation, page number 142, end of bracket, period. And this is called an in-text citation. Students will only get full marks in their essay if I see that you're using in-text in citations because that's one of the real kind of things that I want you to learn when you're doing this is how to give credit properly. Again, just referring back to the seminar that we had, use in-text in citations when you do direct quotations, when you do paraphrasing, or when you summarize somebody else's ideas. Okay, activity seven is the final essay, and there's some real must that I'm going to take a look at for you here. Okay, one of them is that you have to type or word process your final draft, and it has to be in the following format. You have to have a cover page with a title, your name and student number, your course, your teacher's name, and the date. And that's it. So your title page will actually have a, quite a bit of white space on it with, with not a, a lot of text on it, and that's absolutely fine. What I don't want to see people doing is drawing pictures or things like that or doing artwork. And in middle school and elementary school, you might have got marks for this, but when you move on to high school, we're getting a little more academic here. And this is all you want to see on your title page. It has to be double spaced at one inch margins. And it has to have, the font size has to be 12. And the style can be Times New Roman, Arial, or the other one that's accepted is, uh, I think it's called Helvetia. Now, the, what this whole thing is done, or this whole learning guide, is written in Times New Roman. Now in your word processing programs that you guys have at home and at school here, you're presented with over probably a hundred of different st styles, but I want you to stick to the ones that are a bit more formal and academic for your essay. Okay. Again, you can take a look at some of the criteria here. Make sure that your final essay is, is between four to six hundred words. It's okay to go a little bit over. Again, if you're going to go a lot over, have a conversation with me first. So the last activity, activity number eight, is the works cited page. And this is probably the, the part of the essay where students seem to have the most difficulty. Uh, if you're having problems with the style of it, 
please see me in the library and I can help you out. One of the things is always do it on a separate page. Don't do it underneath where you finish your essay off. It should be the last page. It should, on the top of it, very clearly in center, it should say works cited page or just works cited. And then use the MLA style sheet um, that's at the front or on the back of this learning guide, what I've also done, use the back here as well, is I've presented lots of different ways that you can present your, your resources. For example, books, encyclopedias, journal articles, electronic sources, online books and things like that. So I do give you lots of examples to use that, that you can use right here. When you're putting your works cited page, make sure it's in alphabetical order by author's last name first or the title of the article if there's no author. And one of the mistakes people do is they use this back um, thing, back page here, don't write this, books, one author, encyclopedias. This is only to organize it on the back page. When you had in your works cited page, you don't have to put these subheadings. You can put them all together. So, what else to say about the works cited page? That's about it. So when you hand in your, finally, your, your whole package together, what you should have is a cover page, your final essay, the works cited page, your research plan, that was the three column organizer, your notes, your outline, and your rough draft. Okay, and it, there's a little note here that I, I'm not gonna mark unless it's all handed in. Now, one of the other things is that at times, because I work in different parts of the building doing different things and I'm not always in the library, if you can't find me behind my desk, there's a green bin and that green bin says library research essays. Uh, if you can't find me, just pop it in there. I'll mark it. Um, when I have a chance and I'll give it back to your teacher. When you fill the green slip, out, green slip out, what's really important is that you put your teacher's name, don't put my name. Because what I do with that green slip is I hand it back to your teacher who records the mark and then it, it comes to you through your advisor. If you put my name, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know who to give it to. So that is it. I, again, if you're having any difficulties, you can see myself in the library and um, a lot of students ask me how much time this should take. I would say if you'd work on it, it should probably should be about a three week assignment um, because it's worth three learning guides in social studies and then you get the two in English, which is nice. So that is it. Thank you very much and best wishes on this essay.